Good afternoon and welcome to our panel, Becoming Fog, Obfuscation in a Datafying World. My name is Daphne Dragona and I've co-curated this year's conference along with uh, Christopher Gansing. Uh, so um, I would like to just briefly say that this is like the last of a cluster of K1 panels that we curated this year, especially planned to discuss how artistic uh, practices respond to the captural logic. Today's panel uh, follows the live stream of the conference, which uh, particularly addresses this new system of organization of the full take society. So we are interested uh, to explore how this constant data aggregation and correlation of everything uh, can formulate, formulate a system which is predictive and not some, to some extent preemptive, allowing uh, new forms, uh, new modes of uh, regulation and control. Our Becoming Folk panel will try to respond uh, to this question of what we can do when all moves are detectable and recognizable. And we will discuss if and how this practice of obfuscation can oppose today's excessive surveillance. But I'm sure that our moderator, Zach Plas, will contextualize this uh, in a great way. So I would like to briefly introduce Zach, who is an artist and writer whose work engages technology, queerness, and politics. His current work especially focuses on technological control and refusals of political visibility through tactics of escape, disappearance, illegibility, and opacity. Uh, recent uh, relevant prox projects of Zach are the facial uh, weaponization suite, the Contra Internet, and the face cages, which you can see in our current in our exhibition. Uh, Zach is soon publishing uh, two books on the topic, with the titles uh, titles "Escaping the Face" and "Informatic Opacity: Biometric Facial Recognition and the Aesthetics and Politics of Defacement." Currently, he's an assistant professor in the Department of Art at the University of Buffalo. Thank you very much, and please welcome Zach and the panelists. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for being here with us, and thanks to Transmediale for organizing this panel, which gives the three of us to be in dialogue with each other, as well as all of you. Um, so the way that the afternoon session is going to work is I'm going to offer a brief introduction to um, the speakers, and then they'll each give a presentation. I'll offer a brief summary, and then we'll take some targeted questions from two people in the audience, and then after that, we'll open it up to general questions. Okay, today's panel focuses on artistic engagements with a contemporary politics of appearance, visibility, and identification that is playing out in various arenas, such as philosophy, social movements, technology, and artistic practice which centers around obfuscation, imperceptibility, invisibility, and illegibility. In this politics of the not identifiable, refusals of identification and representation are varied. For instance, philosopher Giorgio Agamben's abandonment of representation and identity is found in the concept of whatever singularity, which he proclaims accurately describes the coming community of political revolt. Occupy Wall Street's slogan of no demands also resists this representational legitimation by withdrawing from political negotiation with the state. And there is also the autonomous Marxist tradition of exodus and desertion, which who, uh, Michael Hart and Antonio Negri highlight with Herman Melville's character Bartleby, whose declaration, I would prefer not to, is read as a refusal so absolute that Bartleby is reduced to pure passivity, a generic being that is outside of classification. While protest tactics to evade recognition, such as data obfuscation or mask protest, are iconic to this politics, perhaps it is the writings of the Invisible Committee and Tikkun that best capture this general sentiment. In the coming insurrection, faceless actions and fictional acronyms are encouraged. Flee visibility turn anonymity into an offensive position they write. And in earlier text, how is it to be done, they state, I need to become anonymous in order to be present. The more I am anonymous, the more I am present. And in an earlier text titled The Cybernetic Hypothesis, they succinctly claim that fog makes revolt possible, which is where the title of this panel takes its name. 
So these very political stances, if united, demonstrate a withdrawal from forms of recognition control as well as a refusal or antagonism toward becoming perceptible and intelligible to powers of domination. So what is left is a presence that strives to maintain and be opaque. These political desires coincide with Tikkun's cybernetic capitalism, an imperial government where all life is networked, administrated, and programmable, emphasizing rapid flows, fluxes, and networks of protocological control, management, and informatic capture. Similarly, the media theorists Alex Galloway and Eugene Thacker have labeled the current century as an era of universal standards of identification by pointing towards technologies like genomics, biometrics, real-time tracking, and collaborative filters that bind identification with locatability. Henceforth, they write, the lived environment will be divided into identifiable zones and non-identifiable zones, and non-identifiables will be the shadowy new criminal classes, those that do not identify. So during today's panel, two artists will present their approaches and variations on Tikkun's call to create invisible revolt and become fog. So now let me introduce the artist to you. On my left is Mushan Zaraviv, He's an artist, educator, and media activist based in Tel Aviv in New York. His writing and work explores the boundaries of interface and the biases of techno-culture as they are redrawn through politics, design, and networks. Mushan studied design at Bezalel and interactive media at New York University's interactive telecommunications program. He is an honorary resident at IBEAM and teaches digital media as a senior faculty member of Shankar School of Engineering and Design. Next, we have Heather Dewey Hagborg. Heather is a transdisciplinary artist and educator who is interested in art as research and critical inquiry. Heather has shown work internationally at events and venues, including the Poland Mediations Biennale, Ars Electronica, the Center de Cultura Contemporanea de Barcelona, the Science Gallery Dublin, PS1 MoMA, the New Museum, and IBEAM Art and Technology Center in New York City. Her work has been discussed widely from the New York Times and the BBC to TED and WIRE. So we're gonna be begin with Mushan and then we'll move on to Heather. Okay. Thanks. Okay, so thank you all. Um, I'm going to talk about obfuscation through the lens of ad nauseum, uh, a project that I developed with uh, Daniel Howe and Helen Nissenbaum. Daniel is probably somewhere here. Um, and my presentation would start with uh, why ad nauseum. Uh, from there, I'll talk more about uh, obfuscation and give more examples. And then I'll come back to where do I think uh, this tactic or in some cases strategy can go forward. So a bit background for how did we get to that. So back in 2012, um, there was a lot of um, kind of positive energies towards uh, changing the relationship between um, the, the ad networks tracking of, um, of users and, and the users and what they actually want. And, and that is, the, the, the focus of that was the do not track standard. Now, uh, this was something that uh, the White House ha has backed. Um, a couple of big uh, um, corporations um, have, uh, have joined uh, a working group to, to look at how to address this thing. And just to explain, uh, the do not track standard uh, is basically a flag uh, it's inspired by the robots TXT um, um, idea that I I can ask uh, not to be tracked. Uh, I can I can have my browser tell the websites thank you, but I don't want uh, targeted advertising or targeted anything. Don't track me. Um, obviously, this is very political, and uh, and when and, and it seems like the working group hasn't. Um, managed to maintain the same um, good faith that, uh, that seemed to have, um, to have signaled the beginning of its work uh, to the level of some, um, some major um, figures in the group leaving 
and um, and to to the level of uh, of such disagreements within this uh, standard committee, um, I'll just read you a quote from this one. The group um, ha had not only failed to agree on a definition of the term tracking, but could not even agree on what problem it sought to prevent. Um, and and it it went on. It was al almost murdered at some point. Um, there were. It, I think it's fair to say that there were there are a couple of people of. Uh, uh, organizations uh, sitting on that committee that is there to make sure that it never uh, leaves the room of the committee or the or the forum or the discussion board, right? Um, and yeah, um, at, at some point the faith in this in, in this um, idea of regulating uh, this part of our uh, relationship with um, with advertising on the internet it has started to die. And, and this is just another, another one just from uh, last month to let you know that this is kind of not completely dead but, uh, but and, and showing some signals from time to time of life but then not really um, um, getting anywhere. And one of the arguments that, that would be made by uh, the companies is that there is no need for that because obviously um, the, we have read and agreed to these terms, right? We have all checked. Um, and, and, and it seems like there are, um, there are a couple of approaches to this, uh, um, to, to the idea of being tracked. Um, one is, um, you know, to, to just check the, this box and, with no ideas of the term and hope for the best. Another one is to engage with the terms uh, set un unilaterally by, by other parties and just suck it up. Um, there's the DIY personal individual resistance by using personal privacy tools um, s such as Ghostry and, uh, and other ad blockers and so on, C kind of opt out. So as in, I'm not going to be tracked, but, but this is me protecting myself. What we want to propose is more of a, like of a, of a communal cir circumvention. Um, as we, we, we can say, we want to pick a fight, okay? Um, and that's where ad nauseum comes in. I'll show you a short uh, trailer for the project. As data hoarding corporations keep sabotaging the constitution of the do not track standard and ad network keep selling our profiles behind our backs. We are left with no choice but to fight back. From the studios that brought you Track Me Up, the browser extension that keeps searching to obfuscate your search queries, comes yet another data obfuscation plugin. Ad nauseum. Clicking ads so you don't have to. The ad nauseum plugin works in concert with your favorite ad blocker. Every ad blocked is then silently clicked by ad nauseum, confusing your data trackers by virtually liking all ads. Within your browser, the ad nauseum add-on collects and visualizes your clickstream over time, giving you a small glimpse of the data you passively generate. Ad nauseum works in the background and does not interfere with your browser. Point your browser at this URL and install Ad Nauseum now. Spread the word and help us code as we work to make Ad Nauseum better and to bring it to more people and more browsers. Finally, to the ad industry, we would like to say it is time to be respectful of our privacy expectations. Let's work together towards an honest and meaningful do not track standard. Until that day comes, be sure we will keep pushing your buttons, all of them. So this is ad nauseum. Um, it's it's fun. Okay, so. I must say, there's nothing fun about hiding from um, tracking, but because we want to express ourselves online, right? 
we want, we're there, we're using all of, uh, all of these uh, tools, we're, we're using social media. We, we don't want to hide, we don't want to feel bad about it. it, it th th there's this uh, general tendency to, to see the, the whole privacy debate as a, about like me kind of hiding and, and, and trying to not be seen or to, it, it's really terrifying. Um, at the same time, what we're trying to suggest is that there is another option that is playful. Um, so they want our data, we'll give them our data, but we'll give them much more than they can actually handle. And that's what I mean. So, so, so the way um, ad nauseum works, um, the, there's, you can actually see all of the ads that you've been missing on. Um, we're collecting every ad that you, that you click, um, even, even if you've never seen it before, and you can, Take it all uh, at once, and, and that that visualization uh, that you can try to uh, make sense of by um, kind of drilling in and uh, and kind of uh, brushing it uh, by, by time and and everything is j just a bit of a taste of the mess that we're creating um, and um, and the headache of trying to go through it. Um, so it's a taste of, of data mining, the big picture. And nod to the to the myth of big of big data. So I'll uh, I'll get back to Adnosim later, but I want to talk about uh, obfuscation. And here I'm um, uh, I'm I'm working from um, um, the, mainly the writing of um, of uh, Nissen Baum and Finn um, on the subject. So one um, um, classic example of obfuscation would be this one. We have count of prisoners. We haven't made the final count, sir. I bring a message from your master, Marcus Licinius Crassus, commander of Italy. By command of his most merciful excellency, your lives are to be spared. Slaves you were, and slaves you remain. But the terrible penalty of crucifixion has been set aside on the single condition that you identify the body or the living person of the slave called Spartacus. I'm Spartacus! I'm Spartacus! I'm Spartacus. I'm Spartacus. I'm Spartacus. I'm Spartacus. I'm Spartacus. Um, and this is uh, this is the definition that uh, Brunton and, and, uh, and Nissenbaum are, are using: um, um, the production, inclusion, addition, or communication of misleading, ambiguous, or false data in an effort to evade, distract, or confuse da data gatherers, or diminish the reliability and value of data aggregations. Um, so I'll try to go through a couple of examples of different reasons. To, to, to try, try to answer why and when to obfuscate, okay? So the first one would be obviously to provide cover or plausible deniability uh, from profiling, from surveillance. And there are actually not a lot of examples in nature of, um, of obfuscation, but this one is, um, is an interesting example um, the, this is the, the this is a spider that actually uh, takes the remains of its preys and 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 sculpts small um, small sculptures to look like itself. 
So, so uh, if birds or, or bigger uh, insects would try to attack it, they would first, uh, they, they, might, they might be confused and attack um, the obfuscations of, um, of that spider. It's called the white cyclosa trash line spider. Um, and, and these decoys, and, and, and that, that's why it's I important to also uh, distinguish um, obfuscation from um, 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 camouflage. We're not talking about um, go going into an environment where you disappear. It's kind of the, uh, the opposite of that. It's, it's turning into the, envi to the environment into um, multiplication or, um, or, or just creating noise around you. And, and, and that's what the spider does. Um, I would argue that, that uh, Tor works like that as well. So I'm not going to explain Tor to you. Um, this would take too long, but uh, this is a nice um, uh, illustration of that. The, the, the general idea, is that, though, is that you're not getting a unified uh, stream of requests. You're getting um, a lot of requests that are really hard to track. Um, another interesting example is code obfuscation. In this case, um, um, by malware. If you ever had a WordPress blog, you know what this is. Um, so so th 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 that's kind of a note that obfuscation is not necessarily nice, okay, or good. Another reason to obfuscate would be uh, to buy time. And here uh, I'll bring up an example from uh, World War II. The only way a radar echo can be identified as an aircraft is by its relative size, shape, velocity, and height. Mechanical jamming is accomplished by introducing various devices into the radar beam, which are capable of producing echoes like an aircraft. A relatively small number of highly reflective metallic foil devices, for example, can produce many false target echoes. To the untrained operator, the appearance of many such echoes can be confusing. The decision of the Allied command to use mechanical jamming was predicated on the need to conduct large-scale bombing raids against German industrial targets. To avoid untenable losses, the bombers required protection against radar-controlled anti-aircraft artillery and radar-equipped fighter aircraft. In the Allied raid on Hamburg in June 1943, more than 30 tons of aluminum foil were dropped by Allied aircraft. The result was a 75% reduction in bomber losses compared to those suffered previously in similar strikes. The use of mechanical jamming by the Allies continued throughout the war. So what they needed to do is basically buy time. It's not like um, they could continue like that forever, uh, but it was enough to create uh, enough noise to, um, to make it through. Another example that is kind of interesting would be uh, the Craigslist um, robbery. Anthony Curcio was about to attempt one of the most bizarre bank robberies in recent history. After three months of meticulous planning, everything was in place, including the final detail, decoys. I needed to create the crowd. How can I get people to show up at all this place? You know, at one time or whatever. My thing was, oh, I'm gonna go make a Craigslist posting and I'm gonna get people to wear the exact same thing I was wearing there. He posted a convincing ad luring eager landscapers with promises of 28 bucks an hour. It specified a uniform, blue hat, blue shirt, safety glasses, and a yellow vest, a minor investment for someone looking for a job. He even followed up by email with more details, where and when to meet, and to stay put until their supervisor showed up. And it worked. The morning of the crime, a crowd of hopeful workers stood cluelessly outside the bank. This was the getup Curcio's ad called for. Now imagine me times 15. What's up, dude? Now, one of these guys was going to pull off the ultimate heist that morning. The rest, they were going to help. They just didn't know it. Again, uh, in this case, he just needed to buy time. Um, he, he wasn't caught that day, but he was caught later. Um, another reason um, to do this is to protest and performance. Um, and 
th these agreements that we haven't really signed in the case of, uh, of um, ad networks and online advertising are unilateral and, and we should fight back against them. Um, other examples um, to, to fighting back against this demand of data is uh, this plugin, I like, I like what I see, you can imagine what it does. So it likes every like button. Um, and another example um, that is interesting and historical, um, the World War II solidarity uh, with the um, Amsterdam Jews. Um, so in this case, um, there are some uh, claims that this is a myth, but uh, it's a nice myth anyway. Um, the, um, the residents of Amsterdam have, have chosen to wear um, um, the yellow uh, st star as, as a way of saying um, n not only the Jews are going to wear them, all of us are going to wear them as a way of, of uh, showing solidarity. Um, and then um, another argument would be um, to foil profiling, okay? So um, we have uh, things like loyalty card swapping. Um, uh, we have things like, uh, who, who used to use this thing at the past? Yeah, remember that? So that, that bug, bug me not allowed people to, um, to find um, um, a, a throw, throw away uh, username and password for, for sites that want you to, to, that want to know who you are, you can just use somebody else's password. Um, and then another argument would be um, to impair databases. Um, and that's um, a, a way of uh, just trying to get more noise into their databases. Um, Track Me Not, the collaboration of Daniel Howe and, and Helen Isenbaum from 2006 did that with, um, with search queries, so you would um, the, so uh, track me not would continuously uh, search for random um, uh, text to to obfuscate your actual uh, actual searches. So um, just as a summary, there, there are different um, there are uh, different motivations for obfuscation. Different examples that we've seen. Um, Ad nauseum answers a couple of them and. Uh, and for me, maybe an, an additional thing in the case of um, of, of advertising um, is to to ch to challenge this all too trusting relationship between ad networks and uh, and advertisers uh, to disturb it. Um, and um, it's it's like poking holes in the mythical clouds of big data, because if if advertisers are paying ad networks for fake clicks, um, then there might be a problem with, uh, with this promise of knowing everything, tracking everything, profiling everything, creating mistrust um, in, in this relationship. And I know what m some of you might be thinking, that it's maybe not ethical. Um, and, and I would say in some cases, obfuscation is not ethical. And in, in another hat that I have, I'm, um, I'm working on a, a budget transparency. Um, and one of the things my government is doing is opening data that is obfuscated. Um, and, and that is uh, really hard to, to follow. And, and at the same time, celebrating openness, what's called the open washing or transparency washing. Uh, what we would argue in the case of ad nauseum is that what makes, what validates, what validates uh, ad nauseum is, is the fact that we're using obfuscation as a weapon of the weak. Um, there, there's asymmetries in the relationship between us as individual users that are being uh, profiled and the ad networks that are in the position of power to, to to pull all, all, all of this information. Um, and we have no other alternatives. So um, the, the, there's, we can ask the corporations not to do it. We can try to, we've been trying uh, to work with the regulation. We've been trying technical means. Um, but the unequal distribution of risks and the ben benefits tra trade-off is something that we need to address. Um, 
basically, we're trying to pick a fight and a playful one. Because when, um, the, 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 if the noise is detected, is, sorry, if the noise is undetected, then that's great because our profile is being um, uh, hidden. But even in, in the cases where the, the noise is detected, um, sometimes they would think it's a robot. Um, and then they would say, oh, it's not even a human, and they would throw away the whole uh, data and not be tracking. Um, or in other cases, they'll be, um, and they'll manage to understand exactly what, what is going on there, um, and, and we will register the, um, the dissent and the, um, um, and the protest. And, and to, I'll start to conclude uh, by, by saying that this work is a part of a wider uh, research topic for me. Because um, the, the way I see it, the, as much as the web is celebrated as being very free and open, um, the sub subliminal message of every website that we visit is one of, of obedience. Basically, every, when, when we open a web page, the, the subliminal uh, process we're going through is, what am I allowed to do here? This is maybe um, um, kind of uh, summarized by the title of uh, one, of the, uh, one of the main um, uh, Bibles of the of, of user experience. Don't make me think. It's a re it was originally published in 2000, uh, and it is widely qu quoted and vastly translated, and has framed a lot of the discourse about the role of interaction design as lowering the cognitive um, uh, load to a minimum. And lo lowering the cognitive lo load is is understandable because it's in, in a part of um, the, the issue of affordance. So uh, affordance um, is um, what, what affordance means. The, how can we, how, how could we design um, a system in a way that would afford the um, uh, the attention in a, in a, in a focused way? So so the example uh, for that uh, and affordance is kind of, bu of a buzzword in the u user experience design world. Um, so the door is the example for that. If, if there's a handle, you understand you need to pull. If, if there's some mark for pushing, you understand you need to push. Uh, th this is how systems communicate to you what are you supposed to do. Um, so how are systems affording our commo commodified browsing attention? Uh, can we flip this upside down? What if the affordance that our data is, uh, what, what is the affordance that, that our data is signaling? Uh, when, we're, when we're being tracked in a way, we are creating this affordance. Can we deliberately overspend and reset the price of the tracking attention? Can we flip it on its head? Um, you don't win, you, 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 know, you know the saying that you don't win uh, by having the right answer, but by framing the question. So can we answer, um, can our answer reframe the question? I've been I've been interested in in this idea uh, through 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 this weird t term disambiguation that has made it into our culture uh, like it has always existed. You know, we all know what disambiguation is, but but we but this term actually um, arrived surprise surprise from computer science. It's it wasn't always a part of culture. Actually, culture uh, and especially especially uh, creative culture. Should um, should celebrate ambiguity, not try to disambiguate, not, not try to attack ambiguity, ambiguity as something that doesn't belong to our world. Um, I would argue for reambiguation, and an attempt to go and and, t and and retrieve ambiguity as something that belongs within our culture. So I encourage you to go and uh, install Ad nauseum. Um, we have a new URL. Um, and we have a new version, so go there. Um, we also ran an obfuscation workshop, um, which we will be concluding tomorrow uh, evening. And thank you very much. <laughs>